So we are continuing our series today uh, that's called Go and Tell. It's a series that is going to lead us all the way up to Easter and baptisms on Easter, and it's going to be an amazing, amazing Easter. And uh, we have a guest speaker today. Her name is Sarah Zasky. And for those of you that were at the women's conference yesterday, anyone here that was at the women's conference yesterday? Yeah. So absolutely amazing event. You know what a gifted and anointed teacher that Sarah is. And uh, Sarah is the co-lead pastor of um, Hope Chapel, which is out in Kansas City. She is the co-founder of Trellis, which has uh, been a ministry that is devoted to raising up the next generation of leadership in the church and has impacted our congregation. We've been a part of Trellis for a number of years um, Sarah is uh, a tremendous friend. She and her husband, Jake, have been friends of Don and I for a number of years. We treasure, we treasure that friendship. Uh, she's a, a sought-after uh, speaker, and I think today we had an amazing service in our 915 service. I know that God is at work in just some incredible ways, and God is going to be at work in this service as well. Uh, Jake, her husband, is on our board, and so we've just had a chance for our paths to cross a lot, which we just consider a gift. And so I'm so delighted, so delighted to have Sarah, Z- uh, Sarah Zasky here with us today. It's just a gift for us to have Sarah here. It's been a, a long weekend doing, uh, she spoke twice yesterday and then twice today, but we are so thankful to have Sarah with us. So would you give a huge Fairfax, welcome to Sarah Zasky. Oh, it is so fun to be here. And thank you, Rod, for your kind words. Um, I said it first service and I'll say it again. Um, I am so thankful for the Stafford family, for their leadership over this church, for their leadership across our nation, for even their leadership in our lives. And one night, Jake and I were sitting on the couch and we were having a conversation about how sometimes it's hard when you're a pastor to know who's your pastor, who's pastoring the pastors. And we were talking about what would happen if something happened in our family or there was a tragedy or we just, we needed a pastor to talk to. Who's your first phone call? And we both said, without a doubt, Rod Stafford, that's who we're calling. And so that's who you get as your pastor. Um, And so you can give it up for him. And this is such... um, an incredible church, uh, so warm, so on fire, so excited for how God is at work here. And Rod just prayed about freedom and being free, and I have a testimony to share this morning. Does anybody want to hear it? I have been set free. Can I get an amen? And in and, and lots of ways, but one in particular is that I am in a new season of my life where I have been set free from paying babysitter bills. Any parents in the house? I have served my time, I have paid them all the money, and my kids are now old enough to stay home alone for long periods of time, and I am loving this season of life. Still, when I leave, there is a chance the house may burn down, right? Like, we're at that stage where I'm not totally confident yet. So every time I leave my home, I give them instructions, very detailed, very specific instructions, and I make sure that the very last thing I say is the most important thing because they will probably only remember that. And even still, they usually don't. But when we open up the pages of Scripture as we continue on in the series that is called Go and Tell, this is what we see the gospel writers do. At the very end of each gospel in Scripture, we see this mandate to go and tell. Matthew concludes by saying, go and make disciples of all nations. Mark concludes by saying, go into all creation and preach the good news. Luke says, you are witnesses of these things. John says, as the Father has sent me, Jesus says in John, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. You see, the mission of Jesus was to seek and save that which is lost. On his heart was people. And we have been given the same mandate, the same commission. And so no matter how much culture tells us that we need to privatize our faith and that faith is not meant to be shared, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us sometimes to share the good news with other people, 
No matter how reluctant or how fearful, Jesus' mission has to become our mission. We are not just called to be disciples of Jesus and show up and attend church, but we have called to be witnesses about the things that we have seen and heard. We have been called to commend the works of God from one generation to another. And while we partner with God, may you remember that it is ultimately his work and the life of the people. Sometimes we just get the privilege to set the table. And so as we open up to continue on in the series, we're going to open up to John chapter 1 this morning. John 1, if you have your Bibles. If not, don't worry, it will be on the screen behind me. We're going to pick up in verse 43, where we see this amazing story about what happens when the power of God meets our willingness. What happens when the power of God meets our willingness? In this passage, Jesus is continuing to call and to gather together what would become his 12 disciples. And the day before, we see Andrew and John and Peter begin to follow Jesus. Now, it was a roundabout way of getting there because John the Baptist was out in the wilderness preaching a message of repentance. And he says, it's not me that you want to follow. I don't want you to be disciples of me. I want you to be disciples of Jesus. And they begin to follow Jesus. Now, apparently... A man named Philip, who we're going to read about in just a moment, must have been around when all of this happened. Because here is the interaction that we read that happened between Jesus and Philip. Verse 43, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Let's stop there for just a moment. What you have to understand, in these times it was customary that when people wanted to become disciples of a rabbi, they would begin to follow the rabbi. They would choose them and begin to follow them around. But what's so amazing at the outset of this passage is we see the opposite. Jesus looks at Philip and he says, no, I'm going to pursue you. I want you to come follow me. He sought him out. And we don't know how he knew Philip or why he called Philip, what he saw in Philip that was worthy of saying, you come follow me. But Jesus hunted him down. Jesus sought him out. In response to the invitation of Jesus, here is what we read that Philip does. Verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Don't you see, Philip's response to finding Jesus was to go and tell. Now, the prior day, Andrew did the same thing. Andrew began following Jesus, and it says that he also went to tell. He grabbed out his brother, Simon Peter, and he says, we have found the Messiah, we found the Christ. You have to come with me and see. But this time, Philip does not bring a family member to Jesus. He brings a friend. When Jesus looked at Philip and he said, follow me, come to me, the very first thing that was on Philip's heart is, I don't want to be the only one. There is a person in my life that I love that I care about, that I've been studying the scriptures with, that we have been praying and we have been longing together for the Messiah to come, and I found him. And it's my friend Nathaniel that's on my heart. It's my friend Nathaniel that's on my mind. It's my friend Nathaniel that I have to go first and tell. And in this one moment, we see how one of the greatest tools of evangelism is simply friendship. It's what we were talking about at Abide yesterday, the power of friendship. And so excited Philip tells Nathaniel, we have found the Messiah, but unfortunately he does not get the response that he had hoped for. In John 1, 46, Nathaniel responds, Jesus from Nazareth? Nazareth? Nazareth. Really? Can anything good come from there? For a moment. Have you ever had a person in your life that you've shared a story with and you are so excited and they're like the ultimate killjoy? Like they just deflate all the air right out of your balloon and you're like, okay, well, I thought it was pretty cool, but apparently you don't. So I guess I'll just back away slowly, right? Like they just need some joy in their life. They've been sucking on lemons for far too long. Well, this happened to me when we were moving from New York City to Kansas City. Now, 
spiritual calling aside, there is a whole amazing God story of our move there. But very selfishly speaking, once we got past all the spiritual stuff that God had called us, I allowed my mind to wander for just a moment of what life outside of New York City would be like. And I began to imagine in my mind something called free parking. (laughs) Carts at the grocery store that you can like bring to your car. They don't stop at the door. I began to think about something called a backyard with grass. I began to think about what it would be like to commute to work in a car, not on a subway that smells like urine. And and, and my mind was just going wild. And so there were a few close friends that I began to share this dream with of like life outside of the city. And they looked at me and they said, Kansas? Like, really? Really? Like, you're moving to Kansas. Like, is that a state? Yes, it's a, you know it's a state. Stop it. And they're like, oh, yeah, a flyover state, right? And then they're like, where is Kansas exactly? And I'm like, stop it. Did you go to the fourth grade? You know where Kansas is. No, that's Nebraska. No, that's Wyoming. No, that's Iowa. Kansas is here on the map. And there's actually a city there. It's called Kansas City. And that is where I'm going. And, and those are the terms I had to put it in. Because if I said Kansas, I would just get made fun of. So I decided to save face. And I just started telling people that I was moving to Kansas City. Because New Yorkers live in the city. And so if you attach the word city to wherever you're moving, all of a sudden, it's somewhat relevant, right? <laughs> Now we're super relevant because we have the Kansas City Chiefs and Taylor Swift. I'm like, where were you six years ago when I moved? I could have used you, Taylor, but nope. This is what is happening when Philip found Nathaniel to tell him about Jesus. Nathaniel, I found him. We found him, the one we have been praying and longing and hoping and studying scriptures. It is Jesus. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And in the most cynical, sarcastic tone, he's like, no, you didn't. Nothing good comes from there. It can't be him. He's from Nazareth. It is some classic rival city banter. You see, Nathaniel was from Cana which is only four miles away from Nazareth. And it was only a slightly larger town. So it's kind of like most of you when you travel telling people you're from Washington, D.C., when really you're from Northern Virginia and you're secretly judging me for living in Kansas. I see you. I know you're out there. This was Nathaniel in the moment. It's not like he lived in Jerusalem or anything, okay? Cana was nothing to write home about. But despite his sarcasm and cynicism, in this moment, Philip was unwavering. He didn't judge him. He didn't get mad at him. He didn't try and rationalize. He didn't say, let's open up the scriptures one more time. He just simply changed everything with these three words. He said, come and see. Come and see. Meet Jesus for yourself. Experience the presence of Jesus for yourself. Just come with me because I think if you experience what I experience, you will know that I am not lying. And we read the rest of the story picking up in verse 46. Come and see, said Philip. And when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus said, you believe because I told you, I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than that. And he added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I want you to catch the most powerful word in the story, a word that repeats itself in different tenses over and over and over again. The word that makes all the other words make sense. It's a word of invitation. It's a word of confirmation. It's a word of revelation. And the word is simply this. It's the word see. It's the word see. This word see doesn't just mean to behold with your physical eyes, but it has a a deeper layer, a deeper, deeper meaning that says that you're going to spiritually see. 
that you're going to perceive and discern something is true and something is real because you have encountered it. You have experienced it for yourself. And so Philip says to Nathaniel, come and see. And then there is a confirmation that takes place in this passage when Jesus says, I saw you. And then Jesus provides this revelation moment where he says, just get ready because you will see greater things. Come and see. I saw you, but you will see greater things. And so first, Philip gives this invitation. He says, I know you're cynical. I know you're sarcastic. Here's all I'm asking. Will you come and see for yourself? Will you just come and see? Will you come and meet Jesus? And I believe that Philip was in the position to extend that invitation to Nathaniel in the moment because he was living in the now moment. He was living in the present. He wasn't so rushed and hurried. He had spiritual eyes to see that maybe God wanted to use a mundane, ordinary, everyday conversation passing moment to turn it to one of spiritual impact. I think maybe sometimes the reason why we fail to say to our friends who don't yet know Jesus, just come and see. Just would you come with me to Fairfax on a Sunday? Would you just come and sit down and maybe we can open up scripture? Would you you just come and maybe we could have a spiritual conversation? I I feel like maybe we don't do that all the time because we just take such a passive approach. Well, if you ask, I'll tell you. Or I'm sure someone else will. Or one day you'll find out for yourself. And it's not because we're bad Christians. It's not because we don't care about people. I just think we get so busy. I think we get so distracted. You see, it takes a mentality shift To be able to see the ordinary, mundane moments of our lives as ones that can hold great spiritual significance and weight. Maybe you've seen these initials before. A-M-D-G. If you have eyes to see, you may see them out in the wild in different places. A-M-D-G. The great composer Bach wrote A-M-D-G on finished pieces of all of his work. Pope John Paul II was known for writing AMDG at the top of all of his letters. I once read a story about a student saying there was a math teacher who would write AMDG on the top of his math test, which you'll see is probably not helpful when I explain to you what it means. If you go on my social media, I'm trying to describe my life and summarize what I want my world to be about in in, in a a single word. And so I've written A-M-D-G. You see, it is a Latin phrase, ad maiorum de gloriam, which means for the greater glory of God and the salvation of humanity. For the greater glory of God and the salvation of humanity. This phrase is attributed to St. Ignatius of Loyola. And it's said to mean that anything in your life that is not evil... Even the things that feel spiritually insignificant and inconsequential take on spiritual significance and meaning when you do them for the greater glory of God and the salvation of humanity. Anything in your life that is not evil, even the things that feel spiritually insignificant, take on spiritual meaning and significance if you do them with the mentality, with the vision, with the insight that I am doing this for the greater glory of God, for the kingdom of God, and to see the salvation of humanity. I am just seeing where God's at work, and I am joining him in that work. We are called to be a come and see people. We are called to invite people in to not be so bogged down by the distraction and the compartmentalization of our life, the busyness of our worlds, that we fail to see the thousands of very mundane, seemingly insignificant, very boring, very normal, very a part of our rhythm moments that happen. That if we had spiritual eyes to see like Philip, could take on massive spiritual significance and hold massive spiritual influence for the people around us. Here's what I mean. You can show up to work tomorrow, or you can show up to work tomorrow, A-M-D-G, with the mentality, I am here, ad maiorum de gloriam, meaning I'm not just going to walk into my workplace and get the job done and get the to-do list done, but I'm going to walk into my workplace with eyes to see the people that God has put around me, and I don't want to just tell them what they have to do in the job. I want to get to know their story. I am praying today that some of these business conversations turn into spiritual conversations because I'm not just at work. I'm at work, A-M-D-G, ad maiorum de gloriam for the greater 
glory of God and the salvation of humanity. Maybe you are a stay-at-home parent in the room. You can be a stay-at-home parent or you can be a stay-at-home parent, A-M-D-G, that while you change those diapers that you would rather not be changing and while you sweep the floor and do the dishes and make the meals, instead of complaining and being frustrated, you can turn those into moments of prayer where you begin to pray to God about the people that he has placed on your heart. And you can say, I am not just sweeping this floor. I am sweeping this floor because I'm going to open up my door to my neighbors who are going to come in, and hopefully we're going to have a come and see moment where I can talk to them about Jesus. You can go to your kid's soccer game, or you can go to your kid's soccer game, A-M-D-G. You can be on the sidelines and be like me. I'm that crazy parent where after the game, my kids are like, Mom, you have got... The level of chill, take it down. Five notches, take it down. You're embarrassing me. That's me, I just go crazy. And you can be that parent. And you can sit on the sidelines and you can cheer for your kid. Or you can be the soccer parent on the sidelines, A-M-D-G, knowing at halftime there are people to your left and people to your right that maybe, just maybe, God placed you there for such a time as this because there is a spiritually significant conversation that is supposed to happen in the moment. Listen, you can even attend church. Or you can attend church, A-M-D-G, for the greater glory of God and the salvation of humanity. You can come into this place, and you can check the box, and you can go on your way. And it's all about you, and sure, you worship Jesus while you're at it, and that's great. But listen, Fairfax, we are called the family of God, not the crowd of God, not just friends of God. We are to be the family of God, which means when we come to church ad maiorum de gloriam for the greater glory of God and the salvation of humanity, we're not just here for ourselves, are we? We are here having eyes to see the people around us, and we begin to look for lost and lonely people. We begin to say, Lord, are there certain people that you want me to connect with? to talk with, to pray for. You see someone in the coffee shop sitting on their own and you're the one who goes over and sits down because that moment that feels spiritually inconsequential because we already had the worship service, we already opened up the word together, what does it matter? That moment becomes a moment of spiritual significance and impact because you had the eyes to see. Now here's what I want you to know. While all that is true, Results may vary. Results may vary. You may say, come and see. Can I tell you about Jesus? And people may get mad. They may be dismissive. They may threaten you and just say, if you talk to me about Jesus one more time, like we are not friends. But maybe not. Maybe God had primed the pump of their heart. And maybe the soil has been tilled. And maybe in that moment, they're ready to hear. See, you are not responsible for the outcome. You are not responsible for the results. All you are is responsible for the invitation. You extend the invitation. Come and see. Come and see Jesus. Come and see the person who changed my life. Come into my church. Come and meet my my church family. You extend the invitation, and then you let God do his work. And in this case, we see Nathaniel respond. And he reluctantly goes with Philip to see Jesus. And we read this in verse 47. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. And there's our second C. Philip extended the invitation, come and see, come and meet Jesus. But then Nathanael, in this moment, receives a confirmation when Jesus says, I saw you. When Nathanael and Jesus finally connect, Jesus says something about him. He says, look at you. There is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. In other words, what he's saying is, I know you're not perfect, but I see your heart. I see that you are are good. I see that you're longing. You've been studying the scriptures You've been waiting for this moment. I know that deep down inside you are good. I don't know if you have ever walked through a moment in your life where you have felt misjudged. Anybody? And you know in your heart of hearts your intentions were good. You know that before God you stand righteous and blameless. You know that deep down inside you're a good person, but other people decide to gossip or make up things or misjudge you, and you just feel so misunderstood. I wonder in this moment if this is what Nathaniel was going through. 
where he just felt misjudged. Maybe people grouped him into the the other camp of people who are just holy on the outside but not pure of heart on the inside. And Jesus says, I see right through it all. I know who you are. And Nathaniel says, how? And the answer is, I saw you under the fig tree. Before Philip called you, I was calling you. Before you were invited to come meet with me, I invited you. Before you saw me, I saw you. And it was that little fact about him seeing him under the fig tree, that was the thing that caused a shift in his heart. What was it about the fig tree? Listen, there are some speculations out there, but the truth is we don't know. But what I do know is that what was so powerful about Jesus saying, I saw you under the fig tree, is that it was specific. It was specific. There was a moment in time where something went down with Nathaniel in the fig tree. Maybe it was a moment where Nathaniel had screwed up big time. He had sinned against God. And maybe he was feeling the guilt and the shame of the mistake that he had made, and he sat himself done, down under the fig tree, which was often a place of prayer back then, and he began to ask for forgiveness and repentance, and maybe he was beating himself up. And by Jesus saying, I saw you under the fig tree, what Jesus was really saying is, I love you, and I accept you, and I forgive you. I have the power to do that. Maybe he was sitting under the fig tree studying the scripture saying, how long, O oh Lord? There is a promised Messiah who is to come. I want to see the Messiah in my time. How much longer do I have to wait? And when Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree, Nathaniel knew that he was who he said he was. Maybe he had just had the worst day ever. You know the type of day where everything went wrong, the no good very bad, horrible day. Is there a book about that or something, right? It's like everything that could possibly go wrong has gone wrong. And all you want to do is crawl in bed, be done with the day and say, I will start over tomorrow. Maybe it was one of those days. And he sat under the fig tree in grief in sadness in loneliness. Maybe he even uttered the words in prayer, I feel abandoned. I feel abandoned. And when Jesus came to him and said, I saw you under the fig tree, Nathaniel knew that that was the answer to his prayer, that he wasn't abandoned, that he wasn't alone. I don't know what it was, but whatever it was that Jesus was pointing out was so powerful in his life that his response was this, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. He knew that Jesus' knowledge of that moment was not human knowledge. And can I tell you this morning that God uses people all the time to confirm that he sees us. And so some of the same people that maybe you're just a little hesitant to say, Come with me. Come, come to church. Come and see Jesus. How do you not know that God is placing other people in their life that is confirming the ways in which he is already at work? And the moment when you say, come and see, is the moment that breaks. It's the moment of breakthrough. It's the moment where they're like, oh my goodness, I have to tell you all the ways in which these things have been happening, and I thought they were coincidence, but now I'm in this moment, and you said this, and I know that God is who he says he is, and I think I do need to come and see. And this doesn't just happen for friends who are far from Jesus. I think this happens as, for us as followers of Jesus too. Along the journey of life, God will show up and continue to show himself faithful over and over and over again, to reveal himself to you in new ways that builds your faith so that you have the faith to go out and be a come and see people. This happened to me not too long ago. My father passed away 10 weeks ago. And I, I can't tell you why or how, but as I walked through the weeks of grief that followed, um, my taste buds changed. And that sounds really weird, but I've talked to other people who have gone through grief, and they're like, yeah, like, like the spark from life was gone for a while. Like food that I love just didn't taste the same. But specifically for me, my coffee just tasted so bitter. Now, I am a coffee drinker. Who are my coffee people at the room? Like, there is no Folgers. There is no Maxwell House in my house. Like, we have our bean grinder. It's a ritual, the whole thing. I, like, pre-grind my beans. I set my coffee pot so when I wake up, I can just 
like their aroma of coffee wafting through my house. I would get a coffee-smelling candle if I could, but I wouldn't because it's not the real thing. Like, I want the real thing. I love my coffee. And after my dad died, the coffee tasted bitter to the point where it made me sick. And after a couple of weeks of this, it was a Saturday morning. I'm standing by my coffee pot in the kitchen. I'm in a world of grief. And I just say to my husband, I am so sick of my coffee tasting bitter. I I just want to drink my coffee again. And I was like, will you please go to the store for me and buy me some creamer? Because that's what people put in their coffee, right? The people who don't like coffee, that cover up the taste of coffee, they put this thing called creamer in it. I'm going to give that a go. And so he goes to the store and he buys me fake sugar tasting something. I put it in my coffee. It's fine. It's better. It tastes sweet. And I drink it. I didn't think anything of that moment until the next day I was preaching at our church at Hope Chapel. And as I got done, I came down to the front and I was praying for people. And there was a woman who came up to me and kind of just waited. And she walked up to me and she just said, hey, Sarah, how's your coffee tasting? And I was like, Like, I just looked at her confused. And then you could tell she was a little sheepish, and she kind of began to back away. And I remember clear as day, she kind of turned her head, and she said it different this time. She goes, how's your coffee tasting? Like, waiting for me to, like, be like, you're crazy. I was like, why did you ask me that? She goes, I'm sorry. I know it it was silly, really weird question. I know. I'm just, forget it. Forget I said it. I go, no, no, no. Why did you ask me that? She goes, well, I was just sitting there, and I saw you praying for people, and I was praying for you. And she goes, I know it sounds so weird, but I just felt like this whisper from God, like in my heart, I was supposed to go up to you, and I was supposed to ask you how your coffee was tasting. The God who sees saw me in that moment. I began to tell her the story about the day before in my kitchen by the coffee pot when I sent my husband out to get the creamer because I was in a world of grief. And you know what that did for her? It built her faith that we can hear from God. Even when he tells us to go up and ask people really silly questions like, how's your coffee tasting? That you'd never know how God is going to use you to confirm his presence to the people who need his presence confirmed. You never know how God will use you to be the mouthpiece that doesn't just say, come and meet Jesus for the first time, but confirms that Jesus sees you where you're at in your life. You see, right now, in this city and beyond, there are people under oak trees. There are people standing next to their coffee pots. There are individuals driving to work. There are people up in the middle of the night rocking babies. There are people sitting alone in coffee shops, and they're praying very desperate prayers that sound like this. God, if you are really real, if you do, in fact, care about me, if you are a loving God, then I need you to do something drastic to reveal yourself to me. And we get to be his mouthpieces to not just say, come and meet him for the first time, but to truly listen to God's voice and to be a voice of hope in the midst of the darkness that people are facing. You get to be the answer to someone else's prayer. In verse 50, it says, Jesus said to Nathanael after that moment when he realizes you are who you say you are. He says, you believe Because I told you, I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. And then he added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You see, Philip gave an invitation, come and see. Nathanael received a confirmation in that moment. I saw you. And now Jesus promises a greater revelation of his spirit and his presence. And he says, you will see greater things. What I did in your life is not past tense. It is future-orientated. You will see greater things. And the image that Jesus gives to Nathaniel is one of the heavens being opened and angels ascending and descending. Now, that would maybe be a little weird to us today. But in that moment, it meant something to Nathaniel. He would have recounted the Old Testament story of Jacob on the run, alone, sleeping at night, and he has a dream, and the heavens open, and there's a ladder that goes to heaven, and there are angels ascending and descending, and when he wakes up, he realizes the very presence of God is here. 
That place was named Bethel, and it means house of God. And so when Jesus is saying, you will see greater things, you're going to see the heavens open and angels ascending and descending, what he is saying is that the very presence of God, heaven is coming to earth. When Jesus enters your life, heaven is coming to earth. His kingdom come, his will be done in your life as it is in heaven. And when my presence goes with you and goes before you, guaranteed, you're going to see some pretty great things in this life. The scriptures say that God wants to do immeasurably more than you can ask for or imagine. I think the problem for us is that often our asks are too small and our imagination is too poor. But what would happen if an exchange took place and we begin to ask the things that were on God's heart? We begin to have an imagination that was so big for what God wants to do in and through your life and through this church that we begin to have the mind of Christ. He says, I'll do immeasurably more than that. So I'm asking you, will your faith rise up? Will you begin to ask God for some big, bold, dangerous prayers? Will you begin to have your imagination broken for what is possible? You see, salvation is just the beginning. And a lot of times we make it our goal to see people come to faith. And that's great. It's what this series is all about. But this story invites us, don't stop there. When you invite people in to come and see, may you take the next step and be that confirming voice that God still sees you where you're at. And then may you be a faith builder that says God wants to do greater things. You will see greater things in your life. I mentioned earlier that my dad died about 10 weeks ago. And in those moments leading up to him going to be with Jesus, uh, we didn't realize they were coming so soon. And we found ourselves in a state that he didn't live in, in a state that I didn't live in, at a hospital that we were unfamiliar with trying to find a clinical trial. And what we didn't realize is that his disease was more advanced than we actually knew and that he would never leave that hospital. And so as the days rolled on and it became apparent he wasn't coming home, and as I packed an overnight bag for what I thought would be one night and we were on day eight, I made a phone call to my husband, Jake, and I said, if you want to come and say goodbye to dad. I think you need to come now. The kids want to say goodbye to their grandpa. You guys got to hop in a car and come now. And so they drove up, and as they were driving up, I hopped on the phone with my kids, and I said, hey, listen, we're going to miss grandpa, but we get this really amazing gift. We get to say goodbye. And a lot of times people lose loved ones tragically and we get the opportunity to say goodbye. You guys can say everything you want to say. So if there's anything that you want to ask him, anything you want to know about his life, make sure that tonight when you get in the room, make sure you ask the question. And so that night we gathered in the room and my 16-year-old son just simply said this, Grandpa, tell me the greatest story of your life. I want to know the best story the most memorable story, the greatest story. And I had never heard my dad really sing, except in church, kind of under all the music. And in his frail body and his fading mind, he did not hesitate. And he began to sing, I love to tell the story of unseen things above. Of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love, I love to tell the story because I know it's true, it satisfies my longing. As nothing else can do, I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And then he began to speak, and he said, the greatest story of my life. 
And at that moment in time, he broke down in tears. He could barely get out the words. He said it was about a woman named Marjorie White. He said, I was a young man in one of my very first jobs in my early 20s, and I worked with this woman. She was my coworker. And we'd often be on breaks together. We built a little bit of a friendship, and often she would try and turn the conversation spiritual, and she would ask me if I knew anything about Jesus, if I had ever opened up the Bible, if I went to church, and he goes, and I was so mean to her. He said, I would make fun of her. I'd be like, stop asking me that. This is irrelevant. This is dumb. And he goes, and I pushed her away and I pushed her away. He goes, and this woman was so persistent, three, four, even five times a week, she would try and have a spiritual conversation with me and I would push her off every time. And then he said, finally, one night she said, well, Bob, I guess this is the last time we'll see each other. She said, "Um, I'm actually moving away and today's my last day on the job. I just want to let you know, it's been great being your friend. This is before Facebook, right? Like we're not writing letters here. It's been great being your friend. It's been great getting to know you and um, I'll be praying for you. But today's my last day here. My dad said to Caleb that night and to all of us in the room, he goes, I was kind of relieved. I was like, that's the last time I'll ever see that woman. It was a Thursday night. He said the next day, Friday, he was at work And he looked down into the hallway and he said, there was Marjorie White. And he said he couldn't believe it. She wasn't supposed to be there. She had literally quit her job and said she wouldn't be back in the office. And this woman had come in just to see my dad one last time before she moved away. And when he saw her in the hallway, he said he knew God had sent her. He goes, I don't know what it is. She had said the same thing to me over and over and over. But in that instant, something was different. He goes, that night we sat down and she began to talk to me about Jesus the gospel story about his love for me. And he goes, it was like the heavens opened. It was like a thunderbolt of lightning. And he goes, I had no words for it. I didn't know what was happening at the time, but I now know that it was the spirit of God. It was the Holy Spirit working in the midst of that conversation. And he goes, that night, I just prayed a simple prayer and said, God, I want to do things your way. I surrender my life to you. That, he said, was the greatest story of my life. Here was a man in his final day who recounted his whole life and he didn't recount how big his house was. He wasn't thinking about the successes. He wasn't thinking about the degrees on the wall. He wasn't even thinking about his kids and his grandkids. In that moment, he says, the greatest moment of my life is the moment Marjorie White walked in and said, come and see this man named Jesus. And he said it was the greatest moment because it changed my life and I'm ready for this moment. I'm ready to meet Jesus. It was the greatest moment of my life too. Because of Marjorie White, I had the opportunity to be raised in the way of Jesus. And because of Marjorie White, I'm now raising my kids in the way of Jesus. There is one generation commending the works of God to the next generation. Because of Marjorie White, I received a call into ministry and I get to love and pastor some people in Kansas City. I've gotten to plant some churches. I've got to see the gospel go forward. And I'm praying that because of Marjorie White, something has stirred in your heart today to be a come and meet Jesus, a come and see people. Will you take a moment to pray with me? Even in the quietness of this room, I believe that even as I'm talking and sharing, that God has maybe put someone on your heart. Someone who you know you need to simply extend an invitation to. An invitation to a spiritual conversation, an invitation to Easter, an invitation to more. And I want to take a moment to pray for them and to pray for you, that God would give you the boldness and the courage to speak up. He would give you favor and that God would do what ultimately he does. Lord, today we lift our hearts and our minds to you. And on our hearts and in our minds are the names of some people that we love, that we care about. Maybe that we're just acquaintances with, but for whatever reason, you've dropped them into our heart today. Lord, we thank you that you have gone before us, just like you went before Philip and you saw Nathaniel first. God, we thank you have gone before us and you see these loved ones. And we pray right now through the power of the Holy Spirit that you will work and move on our behalf. You will work and move in their hearts. You will do what only you can do. And Lord, I pray that upon this church would rest an increased measure of faith, a boldness and a courage In your word, it says that your love compels us. May your love compel us to be a come and see people. Lord, may we be bold enough to simply extend the invitation 
knowing that we can rest, God, that you are at work and you will do the rest. We pray this in the name of Jesus.